Yeah, good. You've seen this one, right? This is very seminal. This is these two guys up at Shubenacadie in Nova Scotia. So while Ari's dad and I, you know, fought it out on the track, uh, they, they were doing this. And they just loved it. They came back every night in tatters. He and Ari really kind of grew up at the track, you know, they're real track rats. They really thrived. I thought it was a really good environment. And that's uh, Zach and I. Yeah, he made a really good passenger. I don't think he loved it. <laughs> but he, and he was starting to ride solo bikes and do quite well at that. And so uh, he had kind of lost interest in, in this stuff, I think. But he was nice about it. The hack itself is uh, resting peacefully across the street. But um, the bike has been in here, and I have had to do a little bit of remedial work. I couldn't get it started in the middle of the winter, so we fiddled with it a little bit. Let's get it up where we can see it. What do you think of their plan to ride this over the Canada? Uh, well, I wouldn't do it. Um, <laughs> I think, um, you know, his axe trunk's going to be pulped by the time he gets there, and Aerie's got it worse. So somehow we have to make Aerie comfortable. You know, theoretically, he could just sit out here on a chair. I don't know. It's pretty awful no matter what. I guess he'll do most of the deciding. It's his ass. Yeah, there are a lot of a lot of open questions, <laughs> which I have not answered. Anyway, he's young. I suppose he'll he'll live through it. <laughs> So this is the house that I lived in in uh, middle school and high school. This is my balcony. Yeah. The, the three windows there is my, my bedroom. Oh my god, empty garages. I want to fill them with things. <laughs> Hot diggity damn. Well, well, well. Haven't <laughs> seen this in a while. Who do you think is going to be less comfortable, you or me? Uh, we're both going to be suffering. <laughs> I guess we'll go over by the shop where the tools are. Traverse across the lawn. This is where I'm going to spend the next couple days of my life. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be better than the Dumb and Dumber bike. <laughs> but yeah, it's not a lot of padding. And I, it doesn't look like there's uh, room for a shock under this fender. No. Nicely streamlined and aerodynamic, though. Oh, yeah, it's all about speed. With, with 42 horsepower <laughs> exactly. and 700 pounds of equipment plus, <laughs> plus all of our man meat. 400 pounds of man meat. So everything about sidecars is awkward, including <laughs> assembling them and moving around with them. Oh. Gotta tell those kids to do something meaningful with their lives so they don't end up like us. So this is my dad's first racing sidecar outfit, which he put together with a friend of his in like the early 90s. Long time ago. I guess it would have been. Um, the bike started life anyway as a 1965 BMW R50-2. And as you might be able to tell, the sidecar itself started life as a piece of wood with a wheel strap to it and some <laughs> handholds, which believe it or not in this type of racing is pretty standard. And believe it or not, Zach and I have spent a fair amount of time on this already, although it mm -hmm. was stationary and we were very small children because <laughs> when our dads were out racing together, we were crawling around on this thing mm -hmm. uh, pretending we were racing. So it's been a long-standing dream of ours to actually compete together on a vintage sidecar. So 
it's high time we made that dream a reality. Take our relationship to the next level, you know? <laughs> People have been waiting a long time to see that. <laughs> right <-o. laughs> So, to be fair, there is some precedent for me racing sidecars, which I did later with my dad uh, on a different rig than this, but Aerie has most definitely not raced sidecars before. So, this will be our own little adventure, and it'll be hard for all of the sort of usual CTXP reasons, not least of which our clinically diabolical producer, who has decided that we should ride this vehicle from here in central Vermont to the race in Canada, some 300 miles away. And it feels and looks like even if it was three miles away, just <laughs> down the road, that would be a bit of a struggle because obviously yeah. the rig needs some work. It is not appropriate for street use mm. at all. Um, we have about a day, a day and a half to um, put lights on it so we don't get arrested on the way to Canada and also do something about the rider and passenger comfort so that hopefully our bones don't get vibrated to powder on the way to the track. <laughs> Yeah, so first things first, we'll bolt up the hack and then we'll see if it fires up. And if it does, we'll do some Brodies in the fire station parking lot. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully the firefighters are there because we might need medical attention. <laughs> True enough. Get some tools. We're gonna need this. <laughs> There we go. Yeah. All right, there we have it. Feel solid? Check tire pressures and see if it starts and then rip it around. Smells like childhood. Air cooled, running rich. The carbs are out of sync or something. It's like running heavy on one side, you hear that? Ugh. Happens to the best of us. Oh, it's got a heel toe shifter. That's that touring feature that that's we're gonna need. That's standard. As you go this way, reach to grab here. Yeah. And then but pull then, your left. Yeah, exactly, exactly what you and just then did. And you drop down? Yep. And then as you do that, you hook your, you put your right foot here. Right foot. So all yep. the, you're all the way down over here. Yes. When we're going through right-hand corner at speed on the track, all the forces are gonna be pushing you in. So you're gonna be so pushing gonna be, really hard This right leg's here. gonna be supporting weight. Yeah, exactly. Fun. Well, I've pretty much always thought that sidecars were kind of an inherently bad idea, but racing sidecars especially so. I mean, it is so low to the ground and you have to move around so much and you're surprisingly close, which I guess it makes sense why it's like father and son team that do it or husband and wife that do it because you're just kind of clamoring all over each other and we're not even on the track yet. Yeah, so just imagine 10 times that speed on asphalt with other of these contraptions around us and you sort of get the idea. I'm hoping that I'm going to feel <laughs> a lot better when I've got a full face helmet and a suit of leathers on. That should help. That's a very good point. Also, we have road trip to accomplish before we get to even race, which means we got to put lights on this thing and make it and some. Give me a backrest or what? Legal, like, yeah, and some comfort. I don't know what you're gonna do. We're gonna have to find <laughs> something around here All right, well, to put on there. Push it in and get to work. If the rig was going to pass for street legal, we had to add a headlight, no, no. taillight and some form of a passenger seat. Since our chariot was only designed with racing in mind, there were more hurdles than usual. The um, electrical system is a little weird because it is a total loss system as these vintage racing outfits often are. So there's a battery in there and the way it works is all the power goes to the engine that you need. And when you come in off the racetrack, you plug the battery in and you fill it up with electricity the bike does not charge the battery, typically. We're so, not gonna charge the battery either. We're not gonna charge the battery either. So for a 15 minute race, all good. For a 300 mile road trip, no bueno, especially with lights and that kind of thing. So we're gonna have an auxiliary battery in the hack that will power the headlight, tail light, that kind of thing, which will also be total loss since there's no charging system. <laughs> um, and we'll keep a spare battery charging up in uh, the crew car or something like that and we'll cheat a little bit. Yeah. So you know how in Alaska we were totally independent and self-sufficient? 
We're not even feigning that on this trip. <laughs> We're gonna have a battery charging in the chase truck and a lot of tools and spares. And snacks galore. Yeah. Plug it in, see if we get smoke or if we get light. Yeah, tail light. Yeah, we're hot. plate light. Uh, give the front brake a tug. Yes. People will know we're slowing nice. down, which we're never gonna do. <laughs> Headlight, check. Huh? Yeah. Classy. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty hip, I gotta say. Classy. And then horn check. This one's probably gonna be loud. Show is. So if the aforementioned <laughs> brakes don't work, we'll be able to tell people we're coming. Yeah. But the electrical system is fully functional. Hopefully, you know, the police will accept it. We'll just kind of blend in with the crowd. Making progress, though. There is the uh, small issue of comfort, especially for Ariel here. Lack thereof. I don't know how we're going to accommodate that. That's a good start, and I think talks right about the comfort. In so much as there is none, and it's a hopeless endeavor? So far, it's, yeah. I mean, I've written on that many times, and comfort's not the word that springs to mind. <laughs> Fool's errand top to bottom. <laughs> Aries' options for a passenger seat were limited to what we could find in the shop. Fortunately, my dad's never really done much office work. I think it has potential. Yeah. Very promising. I agree. 22 and 3 quarters is what we're working with. Push it up against the fender. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that'll work. It's like a peach. I'm excited to get going, but I have a sneaking suspicion this is going to be pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> Next stop, Canada. And uh, we're as ready as we're going to be, so might as well hit the road. <laughs> I feel tremendously precarious. All right, off we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this feels very vulnerable. I'm glad I've got stuff to hold on to. I don't even feel particularly secure and I'm on the motorcycle for crying out loud. I mean, it's a racing machine. It's not meant for comfort and it's certainly not made for cross country travel. If nothing else, it's a banner day here in rural Vermont. We got 300 and some odd miles to get where we're going. But hey, the weather's nice. <laughs> Uh-oh, we got a vehicle on the road going slower than we are. Yeah, small town life, you know? Yeah, I feel fortunate to have grown up that way, and frankly, I feel pretty nostalgic coming back to these, these rural parts. What's, a, what's it indicating for our, oh, that, that tachometer doesn't seem uh, particularly reliable. No, it's uh, not really telling us anything useful, unfortunately. <laughs> Just waving around. I'm so grateful for these armrests. This is very crucial. My right foot's up on the, the handhold. My left foot is on the sidecar brace, and I can grip the handholds firmly, so I feel pretty locked in. I'm not particularly comfortable. Mostly it's the pitch forward thing. I'm like really leaning on my hands. Yeah, but your hands. Anything else taking a little pressure right now? <laughs> 
I mean, the, uh, the sheepskin and the gel pad I packed onto the seat is uh, doing good work so far. We'll see. Maybe the uh, all the bumps on the road will warm us up for the racetrack. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's not like this thing has modern suspension. It doesn't have modern <laughs> anything. Woo. My back itches. Little passenger seats vibrating something fierce. <laughs> it's not comfortable. It's supposed to be ridden eight laps at a time, not 20 or 30 miles at a time. Just a few hours into our ride across rural Vermont, we noticed the engine seemed unhappy. It doesn't sound great. No, it doesn't. Running issues aren't unusual with old bikes, and sometimes they just clear up on their own. But this one didn't, and we could only ignore it for so long. Intermittently, the throttle sticks open and you can see that the stop isn't resting against the idle screw, but there's play in the cable and it worked for the past 30 miles, so it's a little confusing. We disassembled the throttle looking for a problem, but didn't find one. So we checked the voltage on our total loss ignition system. It was still holding strong. Why is it doing that? I don't know. Finally, we took a crack at sinking the carburetors, but the issue was still there. And we were out of time. All right, well, we can't figure out what's wrong with the bike actually, and we're a long way from where we need to be. So we're just gonna ride to the hotel tonight and then figure it out tomorrow. <laughs> we're gonna procrastinate. Welcome to New York! <laughs> I did not bring uh, clear safety glasses, did you? I did not! We are behind schedule, and now it's dark, and we only have sunglasses. And we spent $14 on these horrendous sunglasses that are at least not super tinted. I feel like I look like if Napoleon Dynamite rode a motorcycle. That's a pretty accurate assessment. <laughs> well, the right cylinder is certainly running richer than the left cylinder. Yeah, this is arguably a little too lean. But it is, it's interesting that the other side, it's all shrouded on one side. Yeah. We've got a, a little laundry list of things that we're gonna check up on the bike since we covered some distance yesterday, it's an old machine. Yeah, we made an actual list. And we have confirmation that right cylinder is not running on the same air fuel ratio as left <laughs> cylinder. So we got some stuff to pursue before we hit the road today. It's a big day, because we're crossing over into Canada. Intake valves opening should be our next one when you see the piston come up. We are checking valve clearances. So we're going to make sure the valves are in spec. I'm chasing down these throttle cables since we were having quite a bit of trouble with them yesterday with the idle hanging. So eliminating this one issue by just safety wiring all the connections together so that you can't have slack in them. How's that? <laughs> Is that inside the intake boot? The, the phantom 10 millimeter wrench that went missing in the shop? Yeah, we've been looking for this, first of all, and like... <laughs> it's inside. I mean, it's probably not helping the bike run. No. It it's must also have... probably not hurting it run. We found the 10 millimeter wrench! I guess we know who to blame. <laughs> After checking the bike for more of my dad's missing tools, we put everything back together and did what we always do. Hoped for the best. It was another 200 miles to the racetrack, and it was Aries' turn to drive. Oh, what a little sweetheart. 
Oh boy. Are you uh, grunting with pleasure over how comfortable that seat is? Yeah. To Canada. I think that's first gear. No nope. way. Yes. <laughs> On the road again. Losing nerve sensation in my butt again. I see what you mean about the uh, about the backrest being vibrating. We just got started. You just wait till I rev this sucker up. Yeah, good point. My vision's going blurry. Oh, no. <laughs> I can't believe how loud it is with earplugs in. Yeah, it's really, I mean, I've got the, the headsets up all the way and it's still hard to hear and I'm yelling. for Canada. We've done all the homework we can as far as making the bike legal for road use in the United States and in Canada. But, uh, you know, it's a little suspect maybe, right? I mean, you never know at these border crossings. Someone could decide to get a hair up their ass and like, our motorcycle <laughs> is, uh, let's just say it's not really ready to be fully scrutinized. So, fingers crossed as usual. Oh, Canada, where's, oh! Hello. Passport for identification. Certainly. Where are you going? Shannonville. With what purpose and for how long? Uh, we're going to compete in a vintage motorcycle race and we're coming back on Monday. Monday. Have a good day. All right, appreciate it. Thank you. Bye now. <laughs> nice. I can't believe they let us in, dude. <laughs> Are we about to get the rain that we've been worried about? I felt a couple of drops hit me in the face. A little wet and more than a little sore, we had completed the first phase of our journey. Founded in 1974, Shannonville Motorsport Park is one of Canada's oldest circuits. And this weekend it was hosting the Kinte TT, an event put on by the Vintage Road Racing Association. The VRRA is a club our dads raced with for years when we were just kids. And now it was our turn. If the road trip hadn't ruined us. Oh my goodness. That is a unique form of punishment. This sheepskin, did it help? <laughs> <laughs> What's not helping is the fact that it's very wet. Not really ideal for racing conditions, but we made it. The good news is, if you're gonna race around a track in the rain, having a third wheel is actually a great option. It's a good point, in my experience. Yep. It's a practice day here at the track. Uh, in fact, people are already practicing, so we are well behind the curve. Zach hasn't done this in two decades. I've never done this, so <laughs> the practice is very important, but we still gotta prep the bike. Yeah, we've got a lot of stuff to take off that we put on to make it street legal. And all the people in this paddock are looking at us like we have three heads because they've never seen a racing sidecar with all this stuff on it and they think we're insane. So even though we're about to race a three-wheeled vehicle around a track in the wet, we're somehow about to uncrazy ourselves by taking the street stuff off it. We gotta wear these silly vests because we're new racers in this club. And frankly, it's not a bad idea.
Thank you. Okay. All right. Traveled a long way for this. Okay, buddy. Let's see if I remember how to do this. Yeah, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. All right, transitioning. Yep, good positioning. Zach may have grown up doing this, but it was all new to me. As the monkey on a racing sidecar, you are not just dead weight. If your body isn't in the right place at turn in, the rig can tip up or even flip over. So how well the rig corners is largely determined by how effectively the passenger uses their weight to balance the bike. It's a dance that requires careful timing and coordination, and I was just doing my best not to step on Zach's toes. Whoa, whoa, there we go. That is slippery. That's what it looks like when you know what you're doing, I guess. <laughs> nice. Nice job, man. Good. Still struggling with where to put my feet. I feel pretty good about my hands, though. Yep, yep. Okay, man, your first lapse of sidecar practice competition. How did it feel? Oh, terrifying. <laughs> you did a nice job driving. I did not expect to be sliding that much when we were warming up on our first practice laps. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the benefit of three wheels, you know? For anyone that thought sidecars were lame, especially old ones, that is a serious thrill ride. <laughs> we survived practice, <laughs> which is, you know, always the first order of business. You got to choreograph those corners. It is a two person operation. Absolutely. I can feel the way my body weight being a little closer to the rear tire, a little outboard. It totally affects the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not a, you know, people think that the, that the passengers just like along for the ride, but that's not the case at all. Well, it's starting to come back to me a little bit. We started to get a little rhythm at the end there. A little bit, yeah, struggling with my transitions. We did get smoked by one guy in the straight, but then we caught up to him in the infield. So like, you know, Zach and I are competitive. We always want to do well, but again, this is a very foreign experience and uh, it's a team activity. So we'll do the best we can and try and stay out of the grass. After sizing up the competition, it was obvious that we were way off the pace. So with just a few hours of practice left, it was time to buckle down it was time for Shannonville to birth two more champions. It was unclear if our skills had improved, but the next morning the track was dry and it was finally time for Team CTXP to line up for race number one. Any final words of wisdom for me? <laughs> uh, no, good luck. Hold you're, on. You're doing great. All right, All wish right. us luck, daddy -o. Have a little bit of fun. Yeah, we'll try. So our sidecar is getting ready to hit the track. Keep your eye on the 740 machine, that is Zach Quartz, his passenger or monkey as they call it, Harry Henny. They actually rode that sidecar here from Vermont. Zach has not raced a sidecar in 20 years. This should be fun. 
is it, buddy. Of all the racing we've done together over the years, we've never actually done a race together. No, we've been we've been kind of joking about this for the better part of 25 years at this point. Yeah, pretty cool. Get a little heat in the tires on the warm-up lap. Warm ourselves up. All right, man, here we go. Gridding up, you said row 11? Wow, are you gonna be able to see the starter from here? Seriously, we are at the back of the grid. Nosebleed section. Good gracious. Here we go. Red flag coming down. We're racing, everybody. Here we go. Oh, look out, hands up in the middle of the grid. Woo! All right, we're already forward by one position. Yeah, we already passed somebody. Good stuff. Got nowhere to go but forward, buddy. <laughs> All right, closing in on somebody already. Sorry. All good, all good. Back straight away for the first time. Let's go, buddy. Well, we got one of them spinning around here. Into Allen's corner, things are going to get dicey. Wave yellow. Everybody making it by safely, thank God. Got it. Pitch it. Number 7 and 40 there. We were talking about them. They're, uh, they're putting on a show from Redzilla. That's Zach Hortz and Ari Henny. Oh, boy. Some serious G-forces at race pace. Woo, Jesus. Nice. Oh, I think we're getting them, we're getting them, we're getting them. Yep. All right, we made a pass. Excellent, good work. Woo. They got motor on us though, they might get us. It seemed our skills had improved. We were finally hitting our stride, but there was nothing we could do about the old Beamer's lack of sprinting speed on the straightaways. Our only chance of staying in the race was to make up time in the corners. Go for the outside again here. Yep. You got it, you got it. Nice. Got a new fourth place rate. Making the pass on that back straightaway. Many and Courts now in their own battle. Does it oh look at that move by uh, the 740 machine into Allen's. Watch that passenger as they come through this final corner. That helmet will almost be touching that Kirby. Supports it heading on the charge. Nice. Nice, nice. Stick your head out there. They don't want to run over you. Woohoo! Nice racing. 109 just in front of that's John Wilson. <laughs> Man, he's so fast in the left. The so fight right now is for that fourth position. It's in the hairpin as they head onto the back straightaway. All right, let's suck a draft. Oh, well, we've got Quartz and Henny now side by side for that fourth position down that back straightaway. Game of chicken coming to the end. They break these mofos. 740 has moved ahead of the 109 of John Wilson. Ah, ah. Came back fast. This may not be over yet as he gathers it in the hairpin. <laughs> Court and Eddie now looking to make the way past on the back straightaway. They've done it. We found ourselves in an epic back and forth battle with our friend John Wilson and his nephew Vincent. John started racing sidecars when we were little kids. All the more reason to try and beat him to the finish line. Holy cow! Oh no! They've just been sandbagging behind us, those bastards! Well, we did it, man. 
Yes. We raced together. We've been waiting together a long time. Oop. We're puking a little bit of something. Going to have to look into that. We had a rip roar and good time, and now the bike is smoking. So it's classic vintage racing. Pretty typical. Very common that you have to work on your motorcycle when you race vintage bikes. But hey, fix whatever precious fluid it is that's spilling out of the bottom of our cylinder and maybe strategize a little bit. But overall, man, I'm pretty proud of that. We worked extremely well together. Yeah. Nice job, man. We'd survived the first race, but sprang an oil leak from the BMW's engine. So we set out to find a fix. In racing, and vintage racing in particular, when you need help, people are willing to give it. In fact, we found a solution thanks to a handful of fellow racers, including our buddy John. In the world of old, quirky motorcycles, everyone is kind of on the same team. This is the thing that was pissing oil. This is the oil pressure sensor, evidently. They fail quite commonly. So what we've done is we drilled out the center of it where the oil would normally be, and we tapped it, and we're gonna run this little screw with a brass washer and some red Loctite. Problem solved, we're back to racing. <laughs> With our bike fixed, it was time for the final race. And after studying the track more and talking over a strategy, Zach and I felt like we might be able to shave a few seconds off our lap time. Unfortunately, we'd have to do it using sign language. So it turns out technically we're not supposed to have anything on the helmets, cameras, headsets. Yeah, for safety, for which right. makes sense. Safety, which makes sense. And we're guests of the club here, so we're trying to play nice. Also, none of our competitors are using headsets at all. Sidecar racers, from the beginning of time, have not had the ability to communicate the way Ari and I have this weekend. Part of the challenge, right? Indeed. So, the final race. The headsets stay in the pit, we try to find some time, and uh, we do it old school. I got serious nerves right now. Same. High fives and handshakes and bump pads all around. Okay, final race. We're gonna try and put it all together now. We don't have the communicators this time, so I just said that I would lean into him on the left because he can't see me, so I will lean into him so he knows I'm there and he can pitch it in. Okie dokie, here we go. We're going racing. Hopefully he knows what I'm thinking. We're gaining on them in the infield, but oh, they just smoke us on the straightaways. Pretty good battle shaping up for fourth. Here comes that 740 machine. Not shy at all here. Yeah, Harry's quick with the transition. Woo! Yeah, Harry. Nice, nice. Okay, okay. Yeah, we got this. Okay. We'll throw it on the back straight. We 
got Tony behind us, and they are closing the gap. Ugh. Looks like Ports and Henning have actually made their way into fourth position again. They've gone ahead of that machine that was ahead of them. We got him, we got him. I tell you, from up here in the tower, there is nobody getting lower to the ground out there than Henning. was another tooth and nail battle with John and Vincent. There were just two laps left, and we knew that our finish would boil down to the final corners. Go for it! Woo! Go for it! Way to go, Zach! I don't know if we're gonna be able to hold him on the straightaway, but we got him! Oh no! Oh, can't make it work. No, oh, they got us! Nice job, man. <laughs> well, I don't know where we finished, but you know what? I'm proud of what we did because we just gave it our all. That was a hell of a ride. Oh. So that's a bucket list experience. I get to check off my list. <laughs> Riding a sidecar with my buddy Zach. Yeah, Thanks very much, man. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you guys crushed it. Nice Thank you. It's much fun in the stand as I am on the <laughs> Zach and I have been lucky enough to ride and race motorcycles together all over the world. But this trip was special. We grew up at the track, watching our dads race, climbing around on their bikes, imagining the day we'd be able to do the same thing. Twenty-five years later, we finally made it happen. It was a very literal ride down memory lane. From visiting my hometown, to basking in the charms of rural Vermont, to spending time with the vintage racing community. Childhood dreams can fade away over time, but some of them stick around for a reason. And if you have a chance to make one of those happen, take it.